This is a film about the true heroes of Mount Everest. At 8,850 meters, the world's tallest mountain. The Sherpas. They make the Western mountaineer's dream of the summit come true. They carry their equipment and guide their way. Our heroes are Norbu, a 29 years old Sherpa from Kathmandu, at the onset of his career. For me, it's like not only money, not only the money that I'm after right now, but my, uh, even my, from my inner heart, I always wanted to be on the top. And Long Dorji, at 42, a living legend. He stood on the top of Everest 13 times. With the earnings of one expedition, I feed my family for an entire year. That's why I have to work as a Sherpa. This film portrays the lives of the Sherpas and their work on Mount Everest. It's a story about their deserved summit success, but it's also a film about life and death which shows how the Sherpas commit themselves to saving their clients' lives, thus endangering their own. the end of March in Tamo, a small village at 3,490 meters. The Sherpas are a tribe which moved from Tibet to Nepal 500 years ago. They speak a Tibetan dialect, live from agriculture, but have grasped quickly that there is more money in Western expeditions. A case in point, Long Dorji, who helps his wife on the field. His father died early on. I know little about my father. He was in the trekking business too. My mother was a housewife. We also had yaks, which we brought to the pastures in the highlands in summer and kept at home in winter. My mother sold butter and yogurt. Lambu Dorji, the long Dorji, mounted to much thanks to his strength and size. His 13 successes at Everest impressed the Buddhist Lama and simple farmers alike. <laughs> Buddhism is important in the lives of the Sherpa. Therefore, the Lama receives a bit of money and an offering scarf. Dorji and his wife Pasangtiki live in Dorji's parents' house. The money he earns from the expeditions allows them to send their two daughters off to schools in Kathmandu. They hope that their children will have a better life and maybe will even be able to move abroad. Long Dorji still suffers from the fact that he never received an education. He had to take responsibility for the family early on. <coughs> There are many reasons why I couldn't study. My brothers went to school. I didn't. I had to tend to the livestock. Then the oldest brother took my two younger brothers to Kathmandu, and I stayed home alone. I had no help whatsoever. I grew up with the yaks on the pastures in the highlands. Then I became a porter for various trekking teams 
and got to know people. That's how I gained experience in this trade. Because I was strong and smart, I did my work well. Most people like to hire me. His two brothers live in America now. Long Dorji continued living the simple life of Tamo with its traditions, such as the arrangement of his niece's wedding. <laughs> Due to climbing, Dorji became famous and wealthy. Kathmandu is the hectic capital of Nepal. With more than 1.2 million inhabitants, it's the center of the country. It's a melting pot of many cultures and religions. It's here that Nepal's largest Buddhist stupa is located, the Bodhanath Temple. Norbu Sherpa lives in Kathmandu. As a child, he was sent off to live with his aunt in Darjeeling, India, where he received a good education. He tried to find a job abroad, but fell victim to a gang of people smugglers, lost his money, and found himself back in Kathmandu. Here, he eventually found a job at the office of a trekking agency, which works with the Swiss mountain guide, Kari Kobler. You learn a lot more if you take Kathmandu as a starting point for your climbs rather than staying in the village. In Kathmandu you have access to computers and you get to meet foreigners. But mere office work soon bored Norbu. At his urging, he got the opportunity to go on expeditions, first as a kitchen boy, then as a porter, a so-called climbing Sherpa. The prospects of making money and building a better future are bright for climbing Sherpas living in Kathmandu. Norbu does not intend to pursue the dangerous and strenuous career of a climbing Sherpa indefinitely. Instead, he plans to put the fame, money, and contacts to good use to develop himself further. As always before an expedition, a festive ceremony, a so-called puja, takes place at Long Dorji's home. The monks have come from a nearby Buddhist monastery. Without such a puja, Long Dorji would not go to Everest, which the Sherpas call Chomalungma. Chomalungma is a goddess to us. We pray to her before ascending. We ask her for permission and pray that nobody will come in harm's way. And once again, Long Dorji prepares his backpack for the next two months. All the best and safe return. The same to you. Don't work too hard. I'm off now. Take care. So for the next two months, Dorji's wife will be on her own. I worry when the weather's bad. And when people pass by, I always ask if they have news from Dorji. If someone doesn't answer, I always worry that they're keeping bad news from me. I'll only be okay once he's back. Meanwhile, the first Sherpas arrive at the foot of Everest at 5,340 meters. It's a special group that enters the glacier. Ang Nima Sherpa and his icefall doctors. 
Their workplace is the mighty, seemingly insurmountable Kumbu Icefall, the gateway to Everest. Among the icy towers, these Sherpas will prepare the way for the expeditions. Equipped with ladders and ropes, they sally forth into the ice labyrinth. They were named the Icefall Doctors by two Everest veterans who had once watched them doing their job. They watched us work. We set the ladders, turned the ice screws, hit on our ice axes and fixed the ropes. Maybe they thought this was doctor's work. Anyway, before, we used to be called icefall workers, but then everybody agreed. These people are icefall doctors. These Sherpas do their dangerous work before any Western climber sets foot in the icefall. They lay and anchor the ropes and ladders. The icefall is estimated to flow between 30 centimeters and one meter a day. The ice fall is like popcorn. On the surface it's covered with snow and below it's open. In various places echo-like noises can be heard. That is how you know that the ice will break soon. Ang Nima knows the ice fall like no other. Since 1975, he and his team have been setting different routes among these crumbling glacier towers every year. Meanwhile, the Swiss mountain guide Kari Kobler has touched down at the airport of Kathmandu with the members of his expedition. Oh, Durchi. They are met by Long Dorji and his colleagues. <laughs> Kari Kobler has been arranging expeditions to the Everest for eight years. He himself stood three times on the top of Everest. He is accompanied by eight expedition members. Each of them has paid 40,000 Swiss francs to make their dream of the Everest come true. Long Dorji uses his time in Kathmandu to bid farewell to his two daughters. He meets them at his sister's house. The younger of the two is a novice in a monastery. The older goes to a private school. I'm a student. At school, if the teacher asks me what my father does, I say he's a mountaineer. When my father conquers the summit, I'm happy. I feel proud talking about my father's profession. I pray to God every morning for my father's success and that he returns safely. They cannot get used to bidding farewell. The fear that their father might not return one day is overwhelming. <laughs> the icefall doctors continue their work at the foot of the Everest. Ang Nima is looking for a safe route. Because of the danger of falling into a hidden crevice, he advances carefully. Ang Nima, haven't you found a way? No, not on this side, it's dangerous. The other side is longer but better. There, one ladder is enough, here you need five. Over the coming days, they will lay 60 ladders and 3,500 meters of rope. Okay. 
Down at base camp, at 5,340 meters, the yaks and the porters arrive with the material. No less than 41 expeditions are expected. The Sherpas of Kari Kobler's expedition are busy carving out an ideal campground from the ice. Meanwhile, the participants of the expedition approach base camp step by step, submerging into the culture of the Sherpas. In Tenboche, at 3,860 meters, they visit the most important Buddhist monastery of the valley. The monastery was devastated by catastrophes and rebuilt twice. Long Dorji and Nobu walk through the Solu Kumbu with their expedition for seven days until they reach base camp. At this point, the summit is still a dream that might soon come true. Life and death are not far apart at the Everest. The stone memorials in Dugla stand witness for this. They commemorate all those who lost their lives at the Everest. Everest has claimed more than 200 lives so far. Many of them were Western climbers, but there were also Sherpas. It is a place that sounds a note of caution from the Everest. Norbu and Dorji briefly halt their expedition to remember the climbers who never returned from the mountains with prayers and flags. Meanwhile, the dangerous work in the icefall continues. More force! Yeah, come on, use more force! The icefall doctors have reached the most dangerous section of the icefall. People call it the dam. They have tied together five ladders to surmount this steep part. You have to pull them up there. There's a gaping hole behind. Get up and see how large it is. Is the crevice wide there? We'll only be able to see from the rim. If we can't continue from there, we'll have to find another way. Soon, hundreds of climbers will ascend these stairs, laid by Ang Nima and his team. And without which, most of the Everest hopefuls wouldn't stand a chance of reaching the summit. The base camp has accrued to an enormous tent city by now. 41 expeditions from all corners of the world have gathered here for the next two months. There are about a thousand people, mountaineers, Sherpas and other helpers. Kari Kobla alone employs 15 Sherpas. I'd just like to show the team which will help us to reach big mountain, the biggest mountain in the world. Okay, start here. Dorchi. This is Dorji, 13 times on Everest. Angelou, he talks German. Mingma, one of my oldest Sherpas, I climbed Everest with him last year. Dendi, 
Wang Chu has done a lot for us. Last year he was with us in Pakistan. He is one of our most famous Sherpas, together with Norbu, who is also one of our top cracks. And I hope they help us to climb Everest. There are a number of crucial factors. It is important that there are always two from the same region, for example, two from the Makalu region. That is an age-old understanding. They always want to be in pairs, so they can help each other out should something happen. There have to be some with lots of power. They are the engines of the Sherpa team. Then there are the thinkers who coordinate everything and the funny ones who tell jokes, keeping the team in good spirits. In the coming weeks, the Sherpas will be setting up more camps. Camp 1 at 5,900 meters, Camp 2 at 6,400 meters, Camp 3 at 7,300 meters, and Camp 4 at 7,900 meters. They will go up and down, earning good money. Their earnings are negotiated in advance at base camp. Kari Kobla offers a base pay of $2,000 and there will be performance-linked payments on top of it. Two other companies, and we go middle. If somebody makes the more a Sherpa ascends to the high camps and the more he carries, no the more he can earn. Good salary, very good salary. Norbu, the young Siadar, as the chief of the Sherpas is called, translates Kari's suggestions. The Sherpas have their own ideas. <laughs> Let's ask for more base pay instead of bonuses. Other groups pay $2,200. Let's negotiate. How about the payments up there? We should ask for more for Camp 3. We only go up to Camp 3 once, right? So they are haggling over the pay for each high camp. <laughs> okay, uh, you like to get 50, yeah. I like to pay 40. So if we say half, 45, everybody has to be happy. You, me, everybody has to be happy. I don't like if you feel not happy. <laughs> huh? Okay, 45 is okay. Okay, Charlie. Then camp three. Camp two to camp three. You say thirty-five. No, thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. And, okay. and then camp four. How much? It's thirty thousand, Charlie. One. Okay. 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 I give you my last price. Last price. Camp four one twenty. Camp four one twenty. This is very hard, you know. Yes. Everybody know. Yes. Camp four is very hard. Can you agree? Huh? No. Yes. Sure. Okay. Okay. He is the hardest man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Depending on his performance, a Sherpa makes between $4,500 and $5,500 from this expedition. In the next two months, the Sherpas at the Everest will earn twice the yearly salary of a teacher in Kathmandu. But they have to accomplish almost superhuman tasks and risk their lives. You have to jot down your load every day. At the end, you'll have to submit this bill. That's how Kari will pay you. You will not be able to claim that you did not know or that you have forgotten about it. Otherwise, you won't get paid. What they share is a common goal, Mount Everest. We respect Everest as our mother. Could you imagine our lives without the Everest? We recognize the mountain as a divine symbol. We sing this song, I came to you, please love me. We're constantly humming the mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum. On April 17th, 
The traditional Buddhist puja takes place at base camp. In the calendar of the Sherpas, this day is noted as being lucky. The crampons and the ice axes are blessed. A climbing lama conducts the ceremony. Offerings are given to remain in the gods' good graces. During the roughly two-hour-long ceremony, the Sherpas pull up colorful prayer flags over the entire camp. The wind is to carry their prayers in all directions and bring good luck. In addition, there are earthly financial offerings, which the Lama receives. He who wants good luck has to pay for it. Like this? Closing the puja, all throw flour in the air. I haven't felt very well in the past days. Now, finally, the ceremony is over. Now everything's fine. I'm happy. I have strong belief in what our ancestors used to practice. And still, I'm, I'm educated. I'm staying in Kathmandu. I'm not really staying in village. But still, uh, I do practice this in Kathmandu. And this is a strong belief. Then the Sherpas begin their preparations for their ascent to the high camps. In the coming weeks, they have to lift eight tons of material to the four camps up to 7,900 meters. Let's divide this up. First the members' material, then the ice screws, the ropes, the anchors. Then we'll see what else there is. <laughs> the members of the expedition get bags, which they can use to pack their personal material and give it to the Sherpas to transport. This is not enough. There should be 12 kilos for everyone. I weigh everything to determine the precise load. Cap 1 at 5,900 meters is the first goal. Everybody has to pass through the ice fall. The Sherpas set out at 3 in the morning already. This is the life of a Sherpa. What can you do? <laughs> the Sherpas of all expeditions lift their material to Camp One. They follow the route of the Icefall Doctors. Already at five in the morning, there are the first congestions. This ascent is difficult. Many of the Sherpas, as Norbu, are carrying double loads of 20 kilos or more to make more money. A little later, the members set out. Even though they're experienced mountaineers, some of them mountain guides in Switzerland, the ladders of the icefall doctors pose a test of courage for them. Any misstep could be fatal.
Slowly and focused, they move at the unfamiliar height. After three hours, the Sherpas reach Camp 1 at 5,900 meters. They put up the tents for their customers, who will spend the night up here to acclimatize. Fix the tent pegs on all four sides. After the Sherpas have anchored the tents and lodged the material, they descend to base camp to fetch more loads. I like to be in the mountains personally, to, on the summit, but I, I don't like the part which we, uh, the beginning part of the expedition, because at that time you have you have very very hard job with the with the loads, with the with the with the set up the tent, set up the this. That's the very very difficulty part of this job. The next day, the Sherpas of all expeditions ascend to Camp 2 for the first time. Norbu has arrived already to secure a good spot on the glacier for Kari Kobler's expedition. This will become an advanced base camp, offering every comfort. How's it going? So-so. Uh, Pitch three tents over there. Four to five members will be sleeping here tonight. We have to prepare the spot. We have to work, no time to rest. Sherpa Dendi delivers 20 liters of kerosene, which is used for cooking. The other Sherpas set up a complete kitchen tent. cook will stay up here during the next weeks. In the meantime, Long Dorji arrives with new loads. The Sherpas set up five sleeping tents and a big dining tent with tables and chairs for the members of the expedition. Hi. Long Dorji is struggling the still unfamiliar altitude. Ouch, I have a splitting headache. When I bend over, I feel like I'm falling over. The kitchen crew look for fresh ice to boil water. In doing so, they make a gruesome discovery. The glacier has released body parts of a climber who had fallen into a crevice years ago. This is only one of many bodies that have gone missing somewhere on Everest. Many of the dead are never found. Life and death are not far apart on Everest. Work goes on for the Sherpas. To conserve one's strength, a rest and lots of fluid are an imperative. Then Long Dorji departs again. He returned to base camp more than a thousand meters below to get new loads. For five days, the Sherpas will carry material from base camp to camp two for the members. Norbu stays in camp two and supervises the transports. Number one, my solar set. Number one, a solar charger. Number two, two large pads. Number three, a medicine box. Medicine box. Meanwhile, the Swiss mountaineers are in the ice fall, together with lots of other expeditions. They're underway to Camp 2, traveling light. 
There, they will spend the night for further acclimatization. Descending Sherpas cross their path. Inexperienced Everest hopefuls are blocking the way. Right, right. <laughs> Traffic jam, right. What everyone has feared comes to pass. There is congestion at more than 5,800 meters. Long Dorji is back at base camp. Even though he suffered from the high altitude during the last load, he can't let on. Even when it hurts, you always have to show strength. We have to. Some Sherpas leave their loads behind when they don't feel well. Others even turn around without getting anything done. But they get in trouble later. When the Sirdar sees weakness in us, he will complain later back in Kathmandu. He'll say we're not doing our job, or that we're feigning, and we won't get hired anymore. The first members of the Swiss expedition reach the fully set up Camp 2. The Sherpas give them a warm welcome with hot tea. Norbu is doing the inventory in the equipment tent. Eight items for you. How many gas cartridges? 46. Mammut ropes, 11 millimeters. How many? Amongst other things, 50 bottles of vitally important oxygen are ready to be taken to the high camps. I have to check the carabiners. I have five there. How many are on the list? Let's tidy up the tents and lodge the members' baggage. Then we're done. Now everything is ready for setting up the other high camps. But a sudden change in weather interferes with the Sherpas' plans. They're stuck at base camp. With every idle day, the pressure on the Sherpas rises. Once the weather clears up, they'll have to work twice as hard. Kari Kopi prepares them for the task. It can be that we can start on 6th. It can be we can start on 4th. Nobody knows, but Sherpa power is very much demanded. So we need really hard work to get up soon, fast, and the power of every Sherpa will be very important. I need your power. Sometimes you need my money, <laughs> sometimes I need your power. <laughs> okay? That Shio Sherpa are really stronger than Western Army. It's really, really stronger because Sherpa are more, more to the mountains. They are, they are, they are heredity. It's like, a, it's like a heredity that they can absorb. And one thing, uh, money also makes people to work. Expedition member Patrick Sprun has studied the life of the Sherpas. That's the book about history of Sherpas. So they are a little bit uh, telling about how the Sherpa started to get into the mountains, first as porters, but then also as, as mountain guides. Mm -hmm. At the end, there's a list of all Sherpas who climbed once Everest, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I discovered you, <laughs> yeah. Dorji, uh, Lombu Dorji, <laughs> or Big Dorji, or Tamu. Yeah. So did you know that there is a list yeah. where, where you are in? No. You didn't know? No, no. <laughs> What's the record right now? The first is Upper Sherpa, so 17 times. Yes. Second is Chong Nima, so Chong Nima Sherpa. And then Dorji? Dorji, yeah. 13 times? Yeah. <laughs> when did you climb first time Everest? Uh, till now I haven't submitted. I'm always 8, 6, 8, 7, come down with members, yeah. If I make it this year to the summit, then probably I will write some small articles. 
because uh, I've experienced, I've worked as a kitchen boy, started as a kitchen boy and I've reached to this position right now and I've also had like many 8,000 experience, not only Everest, so I'm thinking to write small article about this. <laughs> you are, you are, how old are you, Norbu? I'm like 29 now. And you are 42? Yeah. So we are very lucky to have Sherpas like you with us. Thank you. It's, it's our pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No Thank problem. you, Francis. <laughs> we will have a good time. A nice conversation. I'm convinced. Okay. I have a very good feeling being yeah. with you. Yeah, we too. We also very happy to have a, such a good and strong member like you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> At long last, work at the Everest can continue. Fifteen strong Sherpas from different expedition teams set out. During the next few days, they will gradually fix ropes from Camp 2 at 6,400 meters up to the summit at 8,850 meters. All Sherpas from the big expeditions join forces for this task. It is an exceedingly dangerous task that they carry out here on the 45 degrees steep and icy slope of the Lotsa face. There are many young Sherpas who are technically accomplished and their every step is spot on. Step aside a little. Yes, okay. There's a crevice we want to avoid. The roping crew lays meter after meter of rope on which hundreds of paying customers will pull themselves uphill in a few days. Towards the evening, the crew that has fixed the ropes on the Lotse face returns. Another group of Sherpas is getting ready for the next portion at 7,900 meters. The Sherpas of all the expeditions organize themselves into teams independently. <laughs> Long Dorji is going for Kobler and Partner. In the meantime, the kitchen crew are busy preparing dinner for themselves and the Swiss team. The members of the expedition are being pampered, recovering before they ascend to Camp 3 for the first time. But first, it has to be set up by the Sherpas. The next day, Norbu and his team begin building Camp 3. The load includes tents, pads, cookers and shovels. Norbu explains that this was one of the toughest days. He's fighting his way up on the ropes laying yesterday. The strain is heavy in the thinning air. Good morning. Some Sherpa, they have, they have done one expedition, then they have quit this job. There's because it's so strong. It's a very strong. It needs very physically, mentally, you, you need big, big, big power. And when you are young, you have this power, but you cannot do all the time this job. After three hours, they reach the spot for Camp 3 at 7,300 meters. They pitch the tents between crevices. Let's start here. We can break open the snow over here. It is an exposed spot. The Sherpas have to break open the ice and even out the ground for every single tent. Here too, the terrain slopes by up to 45%. 
Long Doji and his roping team have ascended to over 7,500 meters by now. Hello, great hero. How are you? The hero is having a hard time. We have to fix the rope with a snow anchor. We need more. Long Doji has bad memories of this section. When the weather changes and snow falls, the steep walls of the Everest can turn deadly in an instant. A few years back, Doji got into an avalanche here and narrowly escaped death. I've seen many accidents. Friends of mine have died at the Everest, some of them before my eyes. People were entrained by avalanches, fell into crevices, lots of such accidents. How does it make you feel? thinking about them. Very sad. It makes me want to cry. A friend of mine died before my eyes here. Some sleeping in the same tent as him were caught too. When I think about it, I never want to return to this place and do my job. But I have to. But it hurts thinking about it. Far away in Tamo, at Dorji's home, life goes on as usual. Dorji's wife, Pasantiki, is working the field in front of the house. She has no telephone and doesn't know how her husband is getting along on Everest. I tend to the potatoes, water the garlic plants, weed out and clean up the garden. Lots of tasks like that while Doji is gone. That's my work at the moment. She asks every passerby if they have news from Everest. If not, she asks them to inform her as soon as they hear something. I wait for him, for his return, and that everything turns out well. When the weather gets bad, there are lots of things going through my head. To calm herself, Pasantiki practices ancient rituals. She prepares rice beer to be cooled until Long Dorji returns from the mountains and takes the first drink. Her belief gives her strength. And the a few days before the summit attempt, we go to the nearby Kerak monastery to pray. The last time, I brought rice beer to the monastery. Then we pray again at the monastery and we carry out the council ritual. Long Dorji, Norbu, and hundreds of Sherpas of other expeditions now carry the vital oxygen bottles to Camp 4 at 7,900 meters for the summit day. For many of these Sherpas, this is their most important income with which they feed their families, especially for the elder ones. <laughs> This Sherpa of another expedition carries 12 oxygen bottles, about 42 kilos, to 7,900 meters. Where he gets the energy from is a mystery to everybody. The Swiss mountaineers have now reached Camp 3. How do you feel? Great. Great. Yes. You're looking forward to get on the mountain? But I only feel great because the Sherpas made a great job, you know. With the fixed rope and everything here was ready, we just have to follow the rope and sit in the tent. That's oh, easy. Yeah. 
Are you happy with Sherpa team? It's great. I mean, oh. it's, it's, it's just outstanding what they're making, you know. Cheers, Mike. There are too many people today. It's almost impossible to overtake the climbers. Some advance quickly, some slowly. It's stalling. It would be easier if everyone advanced at the same speed. Like this, walking is completely disorganized. After five hours, the first of Kari Kobler's Sherpas arrive at Camp 4 at 7,900 meters. They occupy a campground, lodge their loads, including 50 oxygen bottles. As a precaution, they lock them up. You cannot trust anyone in the death zone. Longdoji too has finally made it. In the throng, he had to wait to time it again, which was very energy consuming. Yeah. Today it's my first time on the South Coal. Some have dropped already. I lodged the oxygen bottles and other stuff. Three friends are still behind me. It's slightly windy. There's fog coming up. It's still okay though, not dangerous. All's still fine. As quickly as possible, they descend again. Their job is done now. Everything is set up and ready for the push for the summit. Norbu and the other Sherpas are happy to be back at base camp, safe and sound, after all the tough days and dangers. If I were in Kathmandu now, my girlfriend would help me stash my baggage in the tent. But I'm on my own. I have to handle everything myself. Carry my baggage. It's like a one-man army. The clothes need to be washed. Do you smell? Absolutely. Especially my feet. Even fish would die if I put them in the water. Toxic waste. <laughs> Just a poison, a toxic waste. The job is done. All work of the Sherpas. Now all we have left to do is getting the members to the summit. We're waiting for the day. How does the weather look? So far the weather is fine, but I don't know how it will shape up. Before ascending to the summit, the Swiss members visit the bakery at base camp. It is run by enterprising Sherpas during expedition time. And you're making this every morning or what? Yeah, every morning. Fresh? Yes. Short? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. oh they're healthy, they're all precious. <laughs> Chocolate croissant, banana bread, Snack cinnamon rolls, yeah. apple pie. Apple, apple pie. pie and chocolate cake. Okay. Okay. Take this, please. <coughs> banana bread. No. No. But it is the tepid chocolate cake that's flying off the shelves. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For the push for the summit, every Sherpa is assigned a climber, which he is to accompany and tend to. <laughs> okay. Patrick is with Lombudurci. Patrick. Ah, ah that, sorry. <laughs> then Pitch with him Norbu. Then Richard, Wangchu, Wangchu, and Gianni mit Mingma. I have versucht, so a bit of a mischief to be called. I've tried to come up with a good blend of strong ones and weaker ones, of those who speak English well. Johnny and Richard ascend without supplementary oxygen. Wang Chu's English is good, and Mingma is a small machine. If the members are really not strong enough to go alone, 
Norbu points out again that the members can rely on the assistance of the Sherpa during the descent too. This time all climbers are strong, but often this is not the case. If you are not feeling strong, then you can really take the help of Sherpa till camp too. If you are a weak member, you have to, in the bad weather also, you have to always change the carabiner, you have to give him water, you have to, every time you have to open your globes. So it's a, get, it's a risk of getting accident, it's more higher if the member is weak. And sometimes it really makes person aggressive, the Sherpa, the one who is walking with such a... But you can't show that. But we cannot show that because we are paid for, paid for that. And so we can, when we back to base camp, we can, we can, we can express this angry, angriness to our friend, but not to the members. Then it's time for Kari Kobler to instruct his members on handling the oxygen. The air at 8,000 meters is so thin that people might get altitude sickness because of lack of oxygen, which is potentially fatal. If you run out of oxygen up there, it is dangerous. <coughs> Johnny, who has already climbed six 8,000ers, is driven by the ambition to conquer all 14 without oxygen. An important reason why a Sherpa is accompanying you is the constant checking. Whether someone gets altitude sickness and their brain isn't working properly anymore, which is irregular. It mustn't be that a Sherpa risks his life if a member isn't behaving right. One last time before the push for the summit, the Sherpas retreat to their dining tent and enjoy Dido, a traditional barley dish prepared by their cook. In four strenuous days, they want to ascend to the summit with their guests and back. <laughs> In his tent at base camp, Sherpa Norbu sings the mantras for Guru Rinpoche. The great Tantra master is supposed to help him with his bid for the summit and safeguard him. At four in the morning, the Swiss expedition members set out for their way through the Kumbu Icefall, accompanied by Sherpa cameraman. Jane okay. and Ricard, the team medic, put on their crampons. Yes, yes, but today slowly, yeah, yeah. really slowly. <laughs> when you are doing it without oxygen? Yes, we are doing it touched. I and my yes, friend are doing yes, it yes, yes, yes. without oxygen, yes. Perhaps we tried and, and we have to see how far we come and perhaps we reach yeah. summit, yes. It will be very difficult, but uh, we try, we will try and uh, I hope uh, we will reach the summit without oxygen. The Everest, in the real spirit, I believe this is the Everest without oxygen. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good luck. Thank you very much. Okay. Johnny and Ricard bid their farewell. Johnny doesn't know that it's his final farewell. His dream of conquering all 8,000ers without oxygen will come to a tragic end. Once more, all climbers and Sherpas ascend through the Kumbu Icefall. It's mid-May. Most Everest climbs take place during this time, before the monsoon hits. This is when wind and weather are best.
early on the second day, the Swiss expedition takes off in the direction of the Lotse face. Specially trained camera Sherpas who will shoot the unique pictures of the following days and document the story of the expedition to the summit of Everest are with the group. Winds of up to 60 kilometers per hour lash across the Lotse face. As usual, everything is ready for the Western climbers at Camp 3 at 7,300 meters. Tents, pads, cookers, and sleeping bags. The Sherpas stay in Camp 2 today and check the oxygen masks one last time. The oxygen is at level 25 now. The needle drops to zero if the oxygen is used up. If the counter is between zero and five, you have to change the bottle. Understood? This is zero. Take care. The Sherpas are responsible for the oxygen of their guests. We have checked all masks. Sometimes you'll notice a mask is broken when you need it on South Coal. That's why we check them thoroughly down here. At Camp 3, head of the expedition, Kari Kobler, has just received the latest weather data. Norbu, sir, from Charlie, over. Yeah, Charlie, copy. Now he radios them to Norbu at Camp 2. to the fixing team. This night, approximately... 12 o'clock. Until 12 o'clock, there will be some more wind. Wind uh, drops down to around 30 kilometers. And then in the night from 20 to 21 looks very good weather. And then in the 21 midday, same like today, can be some snow falling or little uh, little uh, precipitation, but not much. Okay, Charlie, I will forward your information copy. Next day, the Sherpas plan to climb from Camp 2 straight to Camp 4, but they oversleep. It's 6 o'clock already. We wanted to set out at 5. If I had not woken my friends, they'd still be sleeping. They were sound asleep, I, I don't know why, because it was nice and warm. They're taking off late, which will have consequences. Meanwhile, the members set out from Camp 3 towards the South Coal. When the Sherpas reach Camp 3, they are in for a nasty surprise. Some of the climbers have left their sleeping bags and pads behind because it wasn't clear who was going to take the load. Now the Sherpas will have to carry additional weight. How many oxygen bottles have you got? Okay, each of us takes one. The third we give to Ang Pemba, Lakpa or Nima Tundu. No one is crazy about carrying even more material from 7,300 to 7,900 meters. Norbu is angry. Don't waste your time. Pack your loads, let's climb. Pack your load, that's your job. Tomorrow we'll ask for more money. It's useless to fight. The members are gone already. Had we gotten up on time, we would have met the members and could have distributed the stuff differently. But you've all overslept. Otherwise, we could have discussed this with Kari. But he's gone too. In 
Instead of the projected 12 kilos, every Sherpa now holds at least 26 kilos. Doje and Norbu, who set out last, do too. And still, the first Sherpas catch up with their climbers at the Geneva Spur at 7,600 meters. Good job. All fine. <laughs> Johnny rests a little. He wants to conserve his energy. It's okay. All okay. I need an energy. But tomorrow. But now, okay. Good people. Further down in the throng, Norbu and the other Sherpas struggle with the thin air. The sun is hitting down, the temperature is at zero degrees. The load is too heavy. Everybody's load is heavy today. The personal stuff of the members. Towards one o'clock, the Swiss mountaineers reach the South Coal at 7,900 meters. Norbu, however, is still ascending. The Sherpas only advance grudgingly with their heavy loads. It's a tough job today, with each of us carrying 25 to 26 kilograms. The members have left everything behind. They only have their underwear, their down suits, and a small backpack on them. Carrying such heavy loads in altitudes of 7,300 to 7,900 meters is strenuous. Some need supplementary oxygen, and it's still a tough job. But you forget about all this once you're back at base camp. We can't let on these difficulties. We always have to wear a smile. There's nothing you can do about that. It's in the nature of the job. After an ascent of more than eight hours, Norbu is greeted by the head of the expedition, Kari Kobla, at Camp 4. Okay. Uh, not so tired. But very good. There you go. Okay. Every luggage is hot now. Kelly is crying. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I told him, yeah. if you can talk in the radio, yeah. then you can walk. <laughs> At Camp 4, everybody is trying to regain energy. Johnny, the experienced high-altitude climber, seems tired. Excuse me, could you don't mind to tell you a day today? I was uh, long at heart. <laughs> <laughs> we start uh, uh, not so early from the camp too, but uh, it was uh, a lot of people, so we, we had to, to wait <laughs> a lot, but uh, yes. slowly, slowly. <laughs> Long Doji is among the last ones to arrive. I got myself a sunburn. I got stuck in the midday sun. Couldn't advance. That's why I only arrive now. Deliver. 
Norbu and his team of Sherpas distribute the 50 oxygen bottles among them. Additional oxygen is vital in this thin air. With too little oxygen, you can get altitude sickness and die. Each member gets four oxygen bottles. They can use one of them already in Camp 3 or on the South Coal, so three are left. They'll use one of them in the ascent, we carry the other two. One is in reserve, we use the other ourselves, so altogether we carry four bottles. One last time, the Sherpas demonstrate how the bottles work. Don't now it's off, huh? Oh, you see? Try. No, That's yeah, okay. Nice, yeah. Nice, yeah. We take off at 10 at night. Everything is ready. We will rest for three to four hours now. The boys will eat and drink something and then catch some sleep. We'll start out in the middle of the night. <laughs> Not all of the Sherpas have been on top of Everest. How are you? So far I haven't had a headache. So you're doing fine. This is my first time. What are you putting on your face? It's stinging so badly. They cook tea to take it to the summit. Today was really tough. Do you want to quit? Yes, I do. But there is also the anticipation of the summit. This is my first time. I have a headache. But you can't quit this job. The money. <laughs> It'll be a short break. Three or four in a tent, they try to relax. <laughs> Long Doji uses oxygen for a better recovery. It's 8 o'clock now, only two hours left. I want to get some rest. May 20th, 2008, full moon, 10 at night. Norbu is the first to emerge from his tent. Good morning. Bitte? Alles okay? The Sherpas check the oxygen bottles one final time. Two, three, good. From now on, the Sherpas will use oxygen too. Wait, you have to secure this tighter. First down here, then up here. How is my oxygen bottle set? On one, that's good. <coughs> Okay, my friend. Good luck. And then they take off in the light of their headlamps, marching all through the night. Tonight, more than 100 climbers will push for the summit of all summits. 
Johnny set off an hour earlier because he advances slower without oxygen. At 8,400 meters, just below the balcony, they pass him by. At this point, the other members exchange the first oxygen bottles. Five o'clock in the morning, they reach the south summit. The conditions are good, but every step is painful. The Sherpas secure their guests when they run out of energy at 8,700 meters. Long Dorji too suffers at this altitude. Far below lies the highland of Tibet. Just 90 meters under the summit is the last obstacle, the Hillary Step, named after the first climber to conquer Everest, Sir Edmund Hillary. And then the deed is done. Shortly before nine o'clock in the morning, the members of Kari Kobler's expedition stand on the highest peak of the world, the Mount Everest at 8,850 meters above sea level. Thank you, Jesus, huh? Thank you, my best friend. That's Patrick. We did it. For the Sherpas, too, it has worked out. Norbu is on the roof of the world for the first time. He unfolds his prayer flags to thank the gods. For Long Doji, it's the 14th time. The Nepalese flag on the tallest mountain of the world. Victory to Nepal. This has been my dream since I was four years old. I've tried to climb Mount Everest for four years. This dream has come true now. I am exhilarated. I have attempted from the north and the south the past four years. Now I'm on top of the tallest mountain of the world with the help of my friends. My prayer flags quiver in the wind. I feel close to God. I'm exhilarated. I will never forget this moment. Dorji, how does it feel to be on top of Everest for the 14th time? I am very happy. And not just me. Many of my Sherpa friends are up here for the first time. How many Sherpas are we? Eight. For six out of eight, it's the first time. Wang Chu and I have been up here before. It's great. A great performance. Six new Everest conquerors. And almost all of the members of the expedition are here too. I'm so happy. After an hour on the summit, the Sherpas and the members prepare for the descent. Which pressure? Two, three? Yeah, three. 
Everybody was on the summit, save for Jani, who is still on his way without oxygen. At 8,760 meters, right at the Hillary step, they meet him and Sherpa Mingma. On our way down, I met Johnny ascending at the Hillary step. I asked him how he was. He said he was fine. I thought that it wasn't far to the summit anymore and that Mingma had oxygen on him for the way back. I felt positive. If Johnny reached the summit, it would be wonderful. I didn't see any problems because Johnny could have descended with oxygen. In hindsight, this was a mistake. Jani and his Sherpa Mingma arrive at the summit at 10 o'clock. Jani takes pictures. Everything seems all right. The other members of the expedition are back at Camp 4 by now, marked by a 14-hour climb in thin air. We were all so happy to have reached the summit. We were almost the first to reach the top. It was overwhelming. We got back to Camp 4 and began melting ice and boiling water. After a short break, the Swiss climbers drop to Camp 2 at 6,400 meters, where the air is more saturated with oxygen. Long Dorji is there too. Right then I got a radio message that something wasn't right with Johnny, and that our brother Mingma was in trouble too. All of a sudden, Jani starts to stagger and hallucinate on the summit. Descending, Jani complained about chest pains at the Hillary step. He couldn't walk anymore and I had to drag him down. At the most difficult spots, I went ahead and helped him down. It was incredibly difficult. I thought he was going to die. Johnny asked everyone we met for an oxygen mask. His mind was confused. He acted like a maniac. I had given him his own mask, but he had destroyed it with his hand. I wanted to give him my mask, but he would not take it. Mingma drags Jani on, passing ascending climbers. At 3.30 p.m., Sherpa Dendi and the German medic Richard Brill set out from Camp 4 with more oxygen and further medications and climbed towards them. Mingma drags Jani on. By now, they've been going non-stop for 20 hours. It is incredibly steep at the south summit. I was hardly able to carry Johnny anymore. 
I thought maybe I would die now too. Maybe we'll both die when the rope snaps. It was tough when we were both dangling from that rope. That's how I got Johnny down. At nine o'clock at night, medic Ricard Brill and Sherpa Dendi meet Johnny and Mingma. I don't know exactly what was going on inside Johnny. I only know that we met him on the balcony at 9 o'clock at night. He showed signs of hypothermia and was dehydrated, but seemed relatively fine considering. We tried to get him down from the balcony in the direction of the South Coal. Johnny is given further medications and more oxygen. They seem to help. Sherpa Dendi replaces Mingma. I got Johnny down step by step. I walked ahead of him. Suddenly, he stopped. I had to secure us at this point. When I did this, he snatched the rope from my hand. I was taken aback by his sudden change. Johnny slid away a little from secured position. I just about caught him. When I did that, Johnny was already dead. I shook him and shouted his name. I said, Johnny, come on, we have to go on. But he was dead. I was shocked at that moment. It was the first time I saw someone die in the mountains. Never before did someone die before my eyes. A group of Sherpas brings Jani's body down to the South Col. Sherpa Mingma is marked after a non-stop mission of almost 30 hours. I'm very disturbed at the moment. I never want to return to the mountains again. I'd like to quit my job. But I have no other choice. I have to work to feed my family. I have to work. How much longer do you want to work in the mountains? Another one or two years, then I'd like to quit. My wife doesn't want me to work in the mountains anymore either. The expedition continues. The Sherpas are dismantling Camp 4. Kari also descends towards base camp. He too held out here and coordinated everything. Down at base camp, the members arrive after their summit success. Only during the night had they learned of Johnny's demise by radio. Not only his climbing comrades mourn their colleague, the Sherpas have lost a friend too. The next day, the Sherpas ascend to 7,900 meters again. They don't want to just leave Johnny lying there like many other casualties at the Everest. A big stone they have built his last resting place from stones. In the past two months, Jenny has become the Sherpa's friend. They spare no pain and cover his body with stones. Then they observe a minute of silence. <coughs> we have to pray. We can't say goodbye without a prayer. Today is, today is very sad and very desperate. 
moment for us because we are saying goodbye to our member journey we are leaving him leaving him here in south pole actually journey to us he was not just a member but he was a really good friend of us he has supported us every time his kind kindness and loving and friendly nature has really had made close to us and this is really sad today yeah all i want to say is that bye Johnny is the 211th fatality on Everest, the only one in 2008, a year in which 290 people reached the summit. The expedition is coming to a close. The Sherpas carry all the material from the high camps down to base camp. The time when Everest resembled a waste dump has passed. Everything that goes up must come down these days. After his 14th successful summit, Long Dorji arrives at base camp. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. How many more times does he intend to climb Everest? I've never thought about it. I'll work for as long as I can. But I don't necessarily have to reach the summit for so many more times. I work for as long as I'm able to. Despite all its hazards, Everest is a lucrative business. We sacrifice ourselves for the hard work in the mountains. When we're back at base camp, we try to forget the pain and the difficulties. We set out the next day thinking we'll never do this job again. But then we're back at base camp next year and can't remember all the hardships. And everything is back to square one. Yaks and porters carry the voluminous material of the expedition back to Lukla. Our Sherpas take off too, depending on their performance with $4,500 to $5,000 in their pockets. Good money and lots of fame that they can put to good use. I look good when I put on these clothes and I'm looking forward to the way home, the ladies, the delicious food, I won't be thinking of the Everest for eight or nine months. You need time for the women, too. Long Doji returns to his mountain village of Tamu, to the life of a simple farmer. As every day his wife is out to work on the fields, she doesn't know when Doji returns. <laughs> So our hero of Everest is in for a frustrating surprise. He finds his door locked. That's the business of the Sherpas. Strenuous, danger, good money and success. All in the shadow of Everest. <laughs> 